Hello everybody. The second episode of our program on defense matters, which I call the pre-budget special, aims to focus attention on the state of capability development of the Indian military, the urgent need for modernization, and the possible means to meet the challenges that are being faced. Hope you will find it informative and interesting. On the 73rd Republic Day, a few days ago, the tanks once again rumbled on Rajpath, followed by other military equipment and marching contingents of the three services. Finally, there was a very impressive flypast by the Indian Air Force. However, the question that would have come to the minds of most Indians would have been, is the Indian military as powerful as it needs to be? Despite the fact that we are a peace-loving nation, are we in a position to deter territorial aggression and other forms of mischief by our potential adversaries? The verdict from most experts in the field would be a mixed one. Whereas we are strong enough to deter aggressive action against the weaker adversary, we are not quite there so far as far as the stronger adversary is concerned. In case of the latter, we are capable of giving as good as we get and more in the tactical level battles that may unfold in the foreseeable future along our disputed borders. However, we will have to do much more in the field of capability development and military modernization if we are to really achieve military deterrence at a strategic level. Primarily, our capability development and military modernization for deterrence have to be seen in the context that the external threat India faces from either of our nuclear armed adversaries could be conventional, subconventional, or non-conventional, individually or in combination with each other. The possibility of common security interests and coordinated aggressive actions by our potential adversaries has increased over the last few years as China invests heavily in the China-Pakistan economic corridor. This provides multiple connectivities between the two countries and a land route from China to Gwadar port in the Arabian Sea. China's increased spending on defense over the past decade, as it tries to catch up with the United States militarily, has resulted in the capability gap between India and China increasing steadily in China's favor, both in overall quality and quantity. The economic rise of China and its military modernization has resulted not only in coercion against its maritime neighbors towards its east, but also in military assertiveness, coercion and subterfuge along the disputed borders towards its west. This does not augur well for security along India's borders, both in the short and long term. Capability building of the three wings of the military, the Army, the Navy and the Air Force is essential to meet their current and future warfare needs. Capability building primarily consists of two elements, making up the existing deficiencies in war preparedness and modernization of the force. Important items on the military modernization wish list are fifth generation fighter aircraft, S-400 air defense systems, 155mm towed artillery guns, light tanks, air defense missiles, assault rifles, attack, utility, medium lift and maritime helicopters, armed drones, 
AVACs, other airborne early warning aircraft, anti-submarine ships and submarines, including lease of a second nuclear-powered submarine. As far as indigenization efforts of the military go, the Indian Navy is clearly at the forefront. Reportedly, over 40 ships of various categories, including an aircraft carrier, are under construction in various Indian shipyards. Despite numerous attempts at structured defense planning and capability development in the first five decades after our independence, that is, in 1948, 1963, 1977, and 1986. It was only in 1992 that the Ministry of Defense accepted the concept of long-term perspective plans and issued guidelines for defense procurement. Thereafter, starting 2002, a number of versions of the defense procurement procedure were issued. The latest version called the Defense Acquisition Procedure, which was issued in 2020, aims at providing special impetus to indigenous defense manufacturing. However, largely due to an overall paucity of resources, the outcome remains checkered at best. Even the recommendations of the Cargill Review Committee of 1999 took a long time to be implemented as obvious from the fact that its most important recommendation to introduce the post of Chief of Defence Staff took two decades to implement. Overall, it can be summarised that despite being the world's th third largest military spender, there is a substantial gap between the capability we desire and the capability we actually possess. Before we go any further, let me touch upon something basic that some of you may already be aware of. The defense budget comprises two broad elements. Firstly, the revenue budget for the administrative costs of running the military. Salaries, rations, clothing, fuel, transportation and maintenance. And secondly, the capital budget meant for purchases of new equipment. Due to inflationary trends, the administrative costs of the military keep increasing. The more the money required for revenue expenditure, the less the money available in the defense budget for capital purchases. And to compound the problem, a large component of the capital budget comprises committed liabilities, that is the installment payments on previous purchases of military equipment. All this results in a very small portion of the defense budget being available for purchases of new equipment. Further, complex procedures for procurement of equipment result in long procurement cycles. Consequent delays in military modernization result in calls for raising of additional manpower intensive units and formations to deal with possible threats. More manpower implies additional load on the revenue budget. So it is a vicious cycle for which there appear to be no easy solutions. Much as some of us would like to believe that the fault essentially lies with the process, it is the view of some others that more than any other reason, it is the lack of budget that presents the maximum challenges to our defense acquisition and modernization plans. So what needs to be done to achieve our military modernization goals? In my opinion, there are six things that need to be done, without which military modernization will be slow and tardy. In order of importance, these are, firstly, we need to increase the defense budget. Over the years, the defense budget has borne the brunt of the guns versus butter debate. The defense budget last year at 1.62% of the GDP was the lowest in our history, even lower than the 1.66% of GDP in 1962, 
the year we suffered a major military reverse. Artificially beefing up the defense allocation figures by adding pensions to these figures does not help the modernization cause. Non-allocation of adequate defense budget has resulted in the modernization plans lagging and the wish list getting longer year after year. Consequently, all three wings of the military are burdened with older equipment which require additional funds annually for maintenance. Secondly, the proportion of capital funds for modernization need to be increased in the defense budget in ways that are effective. Increased salaries and maintenance costs eat up a large proportion of the budget in revenue expenditure terms, leaving inadequate capital funds meant for procurement. And considering that committed liabilities eat up a large portion of the capital funds, there is very little left for funding new purchases. Thirdly, a system of non-lapsable cumulative fund for defense modernization must be implemented at the earliest. Every year, the capital funds meant for defense procurement are allowed to lapse due to various reasons instead of being carried over. Unless there is an effective system of a roll-on, non-lapsable defense modernization fund, actual defense modernization will be very difficult to achieve. Fourthly, interministerial coordination for defense modernization needs to be improved drastically. The Defense Ministry and the Finance Ministry need to collaborate to ensure defense modernization happens. The Finance Ministry must not divert funds meant for defense expenditure for any other purpose. Rather than work at cross purposes, a harmonious system should be put in place by the ministries to optimize achievement of the country's security needs. Fifthly, defense procurement must be transparent and above board. Any whiff of wrongdoing in defense deals can set back the defense procurement and modernization process by years, if not decades. The defense procurement procedures must eliminate the possibility of wrongdoing. All details of price and price negotiation must be made available for scrutiny. In case of wrongdoing in defense deals, the perpetrators must be identified and stringent action taken against them. Concurrently, it must be ensured that the fear of accountability does not result in the officials concerned delaying decisions on defense deals. And sixthly, indigenize, but not at the cost of weakening our military deterrence capability. To summarize, in times of serious tensions on our borders, budget 2022-23 is yet another opportunity to provide urgently needed funds and enhanced allocation for defense modernization. The question that comes to mind is whether we will bite the bullet or will let another opportunity pass us by. With that, I come to the end of this episode. I hope you found it useful and interesting. Jai Hind and good day.